Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here and to welcome you to Harvard and to literary studies at Harvard. And we do a lot of things. I'm from the English department. We also have complet and history and literature and all sorts of other things. And we study the arts that use words, all the arts that use words, uh, including increasingly, and this is where I thought I was going to go for our time today, uh, graphic novels and comics. And let's see. I thought that I was going to show you some of the reasons that graphic novels and comics were such a big deal right now, uh, were coming to be, if not at the center, really at an important place in terms of the arts overall. I thought I was going to show you some of the reasons, and I'm not going to stay on this, so be with me. I thought I was going to show you some of the reasons why graphic novels and comics are so important right now and why they become so important. They are a lot cheaper to make and distribute than they ever have been, and a lot cheaper to make and distribute than films and televisions. Let me get here. Um, they are more involving, they are more accessible. They're easier to involve yourself with, to see yourself in, literally to see yourself in. There are faces than a lot of older art forms that take more time to get used to. They can be short, they can be long. They have uh, wonderful, noble histories as short, funny things in newspapers and as medium-length things about uh, super-powered people solving problems in ways they couldn't be solved in real life. They have separate heritages that have come together, the comic strip, the superhero comic book, and more recently, the underground comic book, the taboo-breaking, semi-autobiographical thing. They're a way to combine interest in images and interest in words. Uh, they are something that really just now we have the tools to study, to write books about, and those are courses that are really blossoming here, and it's an art form we encourage you to make. But I realized, I realized as I was getting to this, that as much as I wanted to show you the full range of literary studies here, of things you can study at Harvard that are art forms, it's kind of hard when you don't have a giant pencil and a lot of boards. One, two, it's kind of hard to really demonstrate, three, how many things an art form that is visual and verbal, five, six, how many kinds of things, rewritings of classic texts, there's a great British graphic novel that rewrites Madame Bovary in the same way that Alfred Lord Tennyson rewrote Dante rewriting the Odyssey. Uh, nonfiction reportage, uh, there's a guy named Joe Sacco who writes nonfiction comics who goes to war zones, who draws what he sees in Israel, Palestine, in Bosnia, and other very dangerous places in ways that are involving, uh, that really pull you in rather than just giving you facts. Uh, there are many, many autobiographical comics about being 15, about being 75, uh, that give you what seems like immediate involvement in the world of the artist, of Harvey Picar, of Ariel Schrag, of all sorts of autobiographical comics artists. And of course, there are comics in space with spaceships. That's still going on. There's a comic called Saga, many of you, I hope, are reading. As much as I want to recommend all of those to you and to show you how you can study those things at Harvard, it's a little hard if you don't have the ability to give 300 people 300 copies of a comic. So with the other eight minutes I've got, I wanted to show you the other thing that I do and that we do together at Harvard. And the thing that I really write books about most often, which is poetry. There's a lot of poetry out there. There's a lot of great poetry. There's a lot of poetry that is 600 years old, that is 1,000 years old, that's in Middle English, that is in Renaissance English, that is in Scots, and in Southern African American dialect, and in West Indian dialect, and in Newfoundland dialect. There's English from all over the world that goes into poetry that we will help you study, that we want to show you how it works. 
And there's also, and this is sort of a lot of what I do, poetry that's coming out right now, a lot of which is American. There are tons of it, and I try to read it all. I honestly try to read it all and to sort through it and to help you figure out how it works. And you can introduce in a format like this a couple of great poems that you may not have seen before using nothing but a screen and some words. And we can all read it together. And I thought we would spend a few minutes doing that. One of the reasons I like poetry as an art form so much, one of the reasons it has survived for so long, is that all you need are some words. You can write it down. You can read it to people over the phone if you have to, and they can transcribe it as long as they know where the line breaks are. It has built-in patterns that make it memorable, especially if it is the kind that rhymes, which still happens. If it doesn't rhyme, it kind of other patterns. We'll see some in a few minutes. It's cheap. It's transmissible. It can go with you anywhere. And it can encapsulate, when it works right, what makes you you at the same time as it can convey feelings that maybe a lot of other people can get from you. Um, in that way, it's the opposite of comics. Uh, which require pictures and things in front of you. Um, and I wanted to read one or two poems with you by one or two poets who I think are getting world famous but aren't quite there yet. This is a poet called Laura Kaczynski. This is a brand new poem of hers. A dog about to pounce looks back. If we were in a classroom, I'd ask you to read it with me, but I'll read it to you. This impulse to go, to stay, to rush after it and to turn away, this life like the table set for celebration on a glacier melting a little more every day and candles to be lit on a cake and someone who has never been happier besides someone who cannot bear to look into the happy one's face. And a park full of boys on skateboards and old men on benches today and one mother parting the candle's flames with her bare hands to search for a child behind the science, all respects to the science, behind the science and the saving. Look at this mess, surgical gowns and silver instruments littering the floor of this place. Your child's hand has turned into a mirror. Your child holds up a hand, holds a hand up to your face. Does this rhyme? Does this rhyme? Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kaczynski's poems don't rhyme the way Shakespeare's sonnets rhyme. They don't have a rhyming pattern where you know where the rhyme is coming from. But they have very obtrusive rhymes. Away, day, they have half rhymes, face, today, place, face. That's almost a regular quatrain there, silver, place, mirror, face. And Kaczynski does that for a reason, not just because rhyme sounds cool, although it does. She does that a lot because she wants to get into the language of her poems the way that life, real life, our life, proceeds at an uneven pace. The same thing happens to you over and over. You forget your keys. You forget to call someone back. An old friend emails you. The old friend says, I'm dying. That has happened to a lot of us more than once, but we don't know when it's going to happen again. And that irregular pace gets into Kaczynski's sentences. That's one of the things she's writing about. Another thing she's writing about, and poetry is really good at this, is mixed feelings. Right? There's no dog in the rest of this poem, but there's an impulse. An impulse that if you're a dog, you put into your head, into your body language. If you're a poet, you put it into your words, and you put it, this is one of the reasons why W.H. Auden, another poet I like a lot, says poetry exists. You put it into your line breaks, because what is a line break in a poem except an expression of mixed feeling? A way to go forward and then to turn around. That's the difference between verse and prose. There are prose poems, there are a lot of good prose poems right now, but we're talking about verse. That ambivalence, that sense of, can I go forward with my life? Or do I need to look backward first? That's something else that Kaczynski writes about. And she's especially good at writing about three moments in people's lives where that ambivalence is especially important. One is teenagers. 
She writes a lot about the specific experience of being 15, 16, 17, 18, and having people tell you, go ahead with your life, be an adult. No, don't. Many of you have experienced those mixed messages. I certainly have. It's one of her subjects. Her other two great subjects right now are being a mom and being sick. This is from her new book, The Infinitesimals, part of which is about her uh, treatment for cancer. And so this is a hospital poem, too, a poem about looking back on your life, on her life, and saying, is this going to come again? Do I have a future? She seems to be fine, by the way. Um, I encourage you to read her most recent stuff. She seems to be, to have come through it, and that's one of the things the book is about. I don't want to bum you out. I want you to be delighted by modern medicine, as she is in the book. But I also want you to see the way that those conflicting impulses to look back and to look forward, to be afraid of what's coming next, to look in the mirror and say, to look at your child and say, am I going to see you next year? Those impulses to look forward and to look back are all in the succession of images inspired by Kashiski looking at a dog in the park and then remembering another image, remembering an operating room where she saw a mirror and her child in the past and her child in the future and looked back on it and embodied those mixed feelings, those fears about what's coming next, that sense of the uncertainty of the pace of life through her images and through her rhymes and this very compact thing that we call a poem. And I think I've got about two minutes left. Is that right? Yeah? OK. She's doing this, which means either you go or get out of here, or one minute, or I think two minutes. OK. Two minutes. I want, I want to show you one other poet uh, who I think is terrific, who I've been writing about, who I've been teaching. Laura Kaczynski, by the way, is going to be in this room in about a month reading to people who are graduating from Harvard. If you happen to be around, come see her. Um, here we go. This is a poet called Terence Hayes. He's from South Carolina. He lives in Pittsburgh now. And he's got an interesting life story. And some of his poems really tell that life story. Uh, he's someone who played basketball for a small college in North Carolina. His mom's a prison guard. Uh, his stepdad uh, was in the military for a long time. He writes about all of those things. Um, he recently discovered his biological dad. He's been writing about that uh, in a series of poems that are also based on a Japanese slideshow form called Pecha Kucha. Um, so really amazing biography, amazing commitment to a number of other art forms. He's got poems in the voice of Dr. Seuss, uh, of Cool Keith, if you know who that is, uh, of Michael Jackson, of David Bowie, a poet with a tremendous range, someone I really love teaching and reading and getting to know. And one of the things he does, as well as anyone else alive, is to combine an interest in really serious, uh, sometimes autobiographical, sometimes very straightforward material, the kind of material of your deepest anxieties and memories that some of you probably put on your admissions essays. Yeah? Yeah. Right. <laughs> With word games. I want to read you this poem. Nuclear. How to make a nation say uncle. In other words, how to rule. We learn there will be no clue before it happens. No clear sign from the cosmos. A clandestine airplane appears wrapped in the lace of a black dream. A flash like an ulcer bursting in God's gut. Citizens race about the city as the sky becomes a cauldron. The bones burned clean. Does this rhyme? Is there any pattern at all? Poets love reusing old patterns, but poets also love making up new ones. Is there any pattern at all in those line breaks? OK, what about the last word of each line? Yeah, if I had a cookie, I would give you a cookie. Yeah. This is a series of poems that Hayes created partly to take a break from writing more autobiographically out of the anagram games in daily newspapers. There are a lot of them. They're all 11 lines. They're from a series called A Gram of Ands. And you, I, you see what's going on now. Each of those line ending words contains only the letters in the one word title. 
And this is another way that poetry works. Besides the compression and the line breaks and the idea that here are your feelings in a very transmissible form, poetry is also a way to use strange, arbitrary constraints to be able to say something you wouldn't otherwise be able to say. And in this case, what he's saying, what he is doing, is trying to figure out how we can even address the possibility of nuclear annihilation. This poem's about 10 years old. He's old enough that he grew up with the thing you worry about the most being not rising sea levels, but uh, Brezhnev pushing the button, or Reagan pushing the button. I don't know if the nuclear fear seems dated to some of you, but if you want to substitute everybody being underwater, there's sort of something there. It's a poem about being afraid of the end of the world. And it is a poem that uses its irregularities, its irregular line length. Again, you don't know when the line's going to break, and its patterns. You know what's coming in terms of the line ends as a counterpoint to the fear citizens race about the city. The fear that he is trying to handle. And if he can't figure out the appropriate response to that fear, because there is no appropriate response, at least he can represent it. And that's why the poem ends cleanly. There are a lot of poems out there, a lot of forms out there, a lot of ways to use nothing but language to convey and to explore what it means to be human, to be who you are and not someone else, to have the experience that you have had and that you can maybe share with other people. And one of the many things that Harvard English can do is to help you see the many forms that those expressions have taken. And also, read comics. Thanks. <laughs>